Hi, everyone. What if I told you that you can not only help boost your application's performance with minimal architectural changes needed to your application by using the edge, but that you could also help fight climate change? That'd be awesome, right? I feel like most of us would take that kind of deal in a heartbeat. But if you're sitting there with a little bit of skepticism, I totally understand, because a lot of technology can make these bold claims about what it's able to achieve, while not so infrequently glossing over the limitations in the technology. But I hope that once we're done today, you'll not only be as excited as I am about the rise of an edge-first future that we're starting to see, but that you consider adopting the edge in your own applications. But to start with, we first have to answer the question, what is the edge? And it's unfortunately a little bit of an overloaded term today. Some folks think that when I'm talking about the edge that I'm referring to the network edge, which is where enterprise networks connect to third-party services. And that's a term that's been around since about the late 80s, early 90s. And while that's still a valid use of the term today, that's not usually what we're talking about when we're talking about the edge in its modern context. Instead, what we're referring to is a location where application logic is run and where data is hosted, physically much closer to our users than it maybe historically has been. You might also see the term points of presence or pops or edge locations to refer to the edge, but they all mean the same thing at the end of the day. It just depends on the cloud provider of choice or provider of choice that you're using. Now, some folks wonder what is the difference between the edge and the content delivery network or CDN. And the main difference is that while you can store data through a CDN or at the edge, the edge allows you to run code closer to your users as well. Now, we could probably cover more than 40 minutes talking about the edge in all its forms. So today, we're just going to focus on a subset of that, and specifically with respect to cloud computing. And to start with, I'm going to take a quick step back and do a brief refresher of how cloud providers organize their data centers so we can understand where the edge fits into things and how it's able to boost our application's performance. Now, on the broadest possible scale, our uh, cloud providers organize their data centers by region. So US East 1, US West 1, Asia Pacific, Canada Central, these are all examples of regions. And within each region, there are multiple availability zones, or AZs, and they each contain one or more data centers. And when we talk about origin servers with respect to our applications, we're typically talking about a data center that is located in one of these AZs. Now, taking a look at this next image here, which shows all of the AZs within AWS's network specifically, you can take a pretty educated guess at which users are getting the best performance of our applications. And it'll be whichever users are located closest to whichever of these yellowish orangish dots your code is running in and where your data is hosted, mainly due to the reduced request latency or the distance that the request has to travel for that user. Now, the edge in a cloud computing context refers to data centers that live outside of this network. There's a lot more of them in the world. And when you use the edge in your applications, it's not just one of these edge locations that, that handles your requests. All of them are now available to handle your request. And taking a look at this uh, next image here, you can see uh, just how many more of them there are in the world in the first place. And it doesn't even really paint the full picture because with these blue dots here, those are individual ones, but the purple uh, dots represent multiple edge locations. And then those uh, larger yellowish orange circles are regional edge caches, which gives you the opportunity to cache more data closer to your users before you potentially maybe have to make a more distant request to an AZ data center. So you can see that if you can leverage the edge in your applications, you can significantly improve the performance of your applications due to the reduced request latency. And the regions that stand the most to gain from leveraging the edge in their applications are South America, Africa, and here, Australia. Because as you can see here, they have, all of these places have multiple edge locations. And in South America and Australia, there's a regional edge cache in each. But in the previous slide, you can see that they each have one AZ each. And so if you have maybe legal or business requirements that require you to run code or more likely host your user's data in the same region in which they reside in, and let's say the user is in Western Australia, that request has quite the distance to travel to get to the uh, Eastern AZ. But if you use the edge, you have an edge location right there on the West Coast, and so that request will be blazing fast to fulfill compared to if you weren't using the edge in your applications. So now that we've got all that context, let's take a look at where the edge fits into the request lifecycle. Now, the user in this example, it could be someone interacting with your services, like maybe through a web page on their, on their laptop, maybe it's a mobile application, maybe it's um, a smartwatch app. Whatever it is, 
usually it's pretty straightforward. It makes a request, the origin server handles it and sends a response back. But when the edge is enabled in your application, which is represented by this red diamond here, the edge location closest to the user by default is the first place that picks up and starts handling that request. Now, again, best case scenario, edge location is able to handle that request in its entirety and sends a response back. But let's say that it can't for whatever reason. Maybe you deployed a new version of your website and so you know, the cache is invalidated. Maybe this is too computationally intensive for, the, for that edge location to run or maybe it's not a request that's run very often. What will happen then is the edge location will make the request to the origin and get a response back. And then let's say it is a new version of the website that was deployed and based on where the user is located, it's maybe a localized version of the application that's maybe Spanish or Portuguese. You'll want to cache that if at all possible because going forward, you don't need to make the additional request to the origin server and all these other users in that area that also will want that exact same thing because the requests are being handled by that same edge location will have even faster responses going forward. And then once it's cached, it sends a response back to the original user that made the request. So not too complicated. It's a simple man in the middle kind of architecture. But now that we've got that context, let's look at something a little bit more interesting where we're gonna update an existing web application so that we can start seeing how easy it can be to start incorporating the edge and start getting these performance boosts that come with reducing the request latency. Now, let's imagine for a moment that rather than me working as a software developer by day, I instead have a thriving global e-commerce uh, pet supplies business that I've named after my dog Ada. Ada's Pet Supplies. I have users all over the world. I have storefronts in, in multiple cities and multiple countries. And this, I, I built this application using Next.js because I thought at the time, you know, it's a popular framework, easy to get going. So this is the homepage that you're seeing. So you've got your welcome message. We've got some items that I'm trying to promote, um, whether it's just commonly purchased items or sale items. And then I have this banner at the top that has dynamic content based on where the user is located. So it could be promoting a sale. It could be a welcome message in that person's local language. It could be letting the user know that there's a new storefront that opened up close by to them. Normally with, uh, with Next.js, what I would normally do to get that dynam dynamic content in there is I would use Next.js's middleware to get the location of the user and then add that information somehow to the request and then rewrite that request and get the server-side rendered page to get that value and render the appropriate content. So for this example, we're gonna focus in specifically on the middleware, and this is gonna be running on an AZ data center. So obviously it's a little bit empty right now, so let's add some code. So we're getting the country off of the geo object, which is coming from the request, and then from there I'm adding the country value as a query parameter to the URL before rewriting it, and then the server-side rendered page behind the scenes takes that value, renders the appropriate banner message, and then sends the response back to the user. The downside to this approach is that the server has to render this every single time. This is not cacheable on the CDN like with a static page. And so this is putting a lot of load on my server because this is the home page. And it's not as performant as I, was, as I would like it to be. And I need this to be as performant as I can possibly make it because this is the first impression of my business that users are having. So what I wanna do in my search for easy performance boosting wins is I wanna transition this to a static page, but that dynamic content part is the tricky bit, right? And that's where the edge comes in. So let's take a look at that middleware function again, but this time it's gonna be running on the edge and it's gonna inject the content dynamically that we need it to inject. So it starts off the same, the country's coming off the geo object, which is coming off the request. And then the next line after that, const request equals new middleware request. We're gonna put a pin in that for just one second. That, that functionality is gonna come into play very shortly. But I wanna draw your attention to the line after that. Const response equals await request.next. What's happening there is that is making a request to the origin, but instead of it actually hitting a data center in an availability zone, it's getting the cached static value, the static page, from the CDN that I would have put there at build time. So right away, we're, when we do need to make a request for that page, it's much faster to get. And the, the value of response at this point in time is whatever the default message is in the banner. So let's say it's a simple hello world message just for the purposes of this example. Now, to celebrate me being here at Yao today, I wanna to give my fellow Canadians 50% off their order. So assuming that they're based in Canada, um, I update the message to contain that promo code. And then the two lines after that, uh, response.replace text and response.setPageProp. That's where that new middleware request stuff is coming into play. 
That first method, um, replace text, is updating the HTML um, to contain the message that I want it to contain. And then the next line after that set page prop is updating the Next.js page prop to also contain that same value before sending the response back to the user. So to recap on what's just happened here, we've boosted the performance of this website by having this middleware function go from running in a distant AZ um, relative to our user to being close to them at the edge so the request starts getting handled sooner. We've gone from having a server-side rendered page that was run, running every single time on my data center to being a cache static page at the CDN so when we do have to make a request for it, it's much faster compared to before when it was a server-side rendered page. And then even though I'm not doing it in this code, I can cache this response so that other users that want this exact same thing will get even faster responses going forward. So it's lots of like little things here and there, but they all add up to a really meaningful difference in terms of boosting the performance of our application with what, like maybe 10 lines of code change? It's really not that much. Now, let's say that the edge function isn't some piece of middleware, but maybe some other piece of logic that requires making multiple network requests um, outbound from the, the edge location. Maybe you're validating a user session or doing the initial steps of logging a user in, and you need to make requests to a database somewhere. With the default behavior of the edge, uh, where the node closest to the user is the first place to pick up and start handling that request, you might actually end up increasing the overall request latency due to the latency that's incurred from the request between the edge and that distant database. And fortunately, this is a pretty well-known problem, so much so that there is um, a feature out there to help address this. And the example I want to touch on for this is Cloudflare Smart Placement. So without Smart Placement, you got a situation like this. So you have a user that's based in Sydney, Australia that makes a request. The edge location closest to that user in Sydney, Australia picks it up and then is making three requests to a database in Germany. Now to really like, there's three requests going there and like to really put numbers on it, I remember hearing like a number of years ago that the rule of thumb is that 150 milliseconds, excuse me, 150 milliseconds is added in latency for every request that's going across an ocean. So that's, that's a lot of latency that's being incurred here. So what Smart Placement does is it takes a look at this and it goes, hmm, you know, it's actually more optimal to have this edge functionality run closer to the services that it's making the majority of requests to rather than closer to the user. So instead of something like this, you've got something like this, where the edge location is running in Germany instead of closer, closest to the user in Australia. And so you end up still boosting the performance of your application, but gets around this, um, you know, undesirable behavior with the default um, behavior of the edge location running closest to the user that made the request. Now, speaking of data and databases, um, there was someone from the Remix framework team uh, that mentioned in a blog post at some point last year that it doesn't matter how much of our applications uh, code that we move to the edge, if our data, like in this example, is still living in a pretty far away server relative to our users. And so the next frontier for boosting our performance um, for our applications using the edge isn't just moving more code to the edge, it's figuring out how to store data at the edge as well, or failing that, at least make it accessible in an edge environment so that you can cache it there. Historically, though, there's been a couple of challenges with doing so, and they are your stereotypical database problems. The first is the limited number of connections that is in a database. How do you ensure that when hundreds of thousands or potentially millions of edge functions are spinning up and trying to access your database, that you don't exhaust the connections on the database, it falls over and it takes your application down with it? And then the other bit to this is data consistency. How do you ensure that when data is updated in one edge location somewhere in the world, that the cache values in other edge locations are invalidated and updated in a timely manner. And there's a couple of uh, database vendors that attempt to tackle this problem. And the first that I want to touch on is PlanetScale. So what they do is when you make a request for data in a database that they manage from an edge environment, they have a global routing infrastructure that they've characterized as similar to a CDN. And so the node in that CDN closest to the edge location that's making that request will pick up that request and backhaul it over long-held connection pools. Now, under the hood, PlanetScale uses this database clustering system called Vitesse, which also has connection pools in it. And so as traffic starts scaling to the database and the database starts horizontally scaling, the connection pools in Vitesse scale with it. 
And so it's able to handle this incredible amount of load. Um, they have like a blog post where they talked about load testing this functionality. And this, was able to ha this approach was able to handle a million open connections without the database even breaking a sweat. Could easily have handled a lot more. Now the other approach I want to talk about is Cloudflare's durable objects. They've characterized durable objects. Um, durable objects are to databases what serverless functions are to web applications. So taking a big monolithic database and breaking it into smaller pieces. When you create a durable object, it's created in the edge location closest to the user that made it, and they are globally unique, and they can only see and modify, excuse me, uh, read and modify their own data uh, to help ensure the strong data consistency we want to see from our database. Now, the, the downside to you know, that more fragmented approach is that if you as a developer need data from multiple durable objects, you will need to make those requests, or multiple requests, um, in order to get that data and stitch the data together at an application level but you would be doing this through Cloudflare's edge network. So those requests will actually be much faster compared to if you were just making those requests over the public internet. Now you might be sitting there and thinking, but Erica, I already am perfectly happy with my existing database that lives in a single region somewhere. I don't wanna try some newfangled company's database. I just want to figure out how I can improve the performance of accessing data from my database using the edge. What's out there for me? And fortunately, there's a very, very recent development in this space. Um, and I know I'm gonna sound like a Cloudflare fangirl, but they have some really cool stuff here. Um, and the thing that you can use for this sort of situation is Cloudflare's hyperdrive. So what this does is hyperdrive instances live at the edge um, in the same data centers where um, Cloudflare workers, which is their edge function offering, also live. And right away, it boosts the performance of accessing data in your single region database by maintaining warm connections to that database. So it's re removing the request latency, or at least drastically reducing it, from that initial handshaking and authorization with your database. Now, the other really cool thing about Hyperdrive is that it can tell the difference between a read and a write query, and it caches the read queries at the edge. So as a result, you start getting um, what feels like a more globally distributed database, even though it's in a single region somewhere. It's so a really exciting stuff. Now, I should note, despite my you know, earlier example of you know, the pet store and it kind of implying that maybe the edge is just for web or full stack developers, it's really not. Um, mobile and backend developers may also want to consider the edge for their use cases. Starting with mobile developers, they have a couple of you know, considerations that are maybe a bit more top of mind for them compared to other uh, software development specializations. The first is intermittent connectivity. We've likely all experienced a dead zone at some point in our lives. Um, and with that in mind, the speed at which requests are fulfilled is crucial to ensuring with a higher degree of certainty that when a user takes an action, that they get a response back. The other bit to this is people don't update their apps. Um, we've gone a lot better as an industry. We've, we've made it possible where you, know, you just come home and the second you're on Wi-Fi, your app updates and your OS updates are automatically applied but there's still people out there that can't update their applications or their phones. And one user that I wanted to highlight here um, as being an example of this kind of just to paint a picture in case you're, you're a bit skeptical of me saying that is my younger sister, Monica. Now in my household, just to set some context, we run our devices into the ground. We don't refresh our phones every two to three years. We usually try and go for four or five years. I think the record right now is held by my mom who had one of those like swivel Sony Ericsson phones from the mid 2000s, if anyone remembers those. She loved this thing to death. Um, and the only reason she got rid of it is because it had a very suspicious rattle to it. Um, so, you know, two, three years is nothing. And my sister had this iPhone a number of years ago where it was like maybe two and a half years old, but she had completely used up the storage on it. And not just like on the phone itself, but also her iCloud account. And then she paid for more iCloud storage and then used that up quickly as well. And then for months, she could not update her phone because there was no memory for the apps to update. And she would try her best, to her credit. She would like, you know, every so often sit down, try and like get rid of data that she didn't need anymore. But then some app would like sneak in and apply its updates before she could, you know, apply the zero day security fixes that are very important from Apple. So to account for users like that, developers are incentivized to deliver as much of their services as possible from a server that they control. And so building on that previous point around intermittent connectivity, if that server that they're, they're serving their changes from, their functionality from, is very distant relative to the user, it's more likely that those requests will get dropped. So it's not just uh, you know, performance that we're concerned about anymore, we're also concerned about service reliability in this case. Now to quickly touch on backend developers, 
they are making requests all over the place. They might be you know, serving developers through APIs. They could be communicating with internal services, various third-party services, and especially the third-party services, they can't control where those data centers are. And so a lot of latency can be incurred from making requests to those services depending on the functionality that you're trying to fulfill. Now in both of these cases, it, you can, like I've said before, you can reduce the request latency by running stuff at the edge as much as possible. And one pattern that someone could use in both of these cases to help improve the performance of your services is to run an API layer at the edge. So it allows you to have a stable contract with whatever your end consumer is, and then you can still evolve your services behind the scenes and cache popular responses at that API layer. Now, if you need like super responsive um, like services, like I'm talking near real time, edge computing is actually becoming increasingly available through the 5G mobile network. This is not widely available necessarily just yet. It's mainly in major cities. Um, and so far, at least from what I've seen, it's, the use case seems to be connected vehicle applications, which honestly is a terrifying thing for me to say. But there's a lot of promise here around, like let's say, healthcare applications, where you can be very fast um, in terms of responding to maybe a medical emergency. Now, even with the challenges around connectivity, I think it's fair to say that the majority of us have the privilege and good fortune to live and work in areas with pretty reliable internet. When we do have an outage, it's like maybe a blip. If it's major, maybe it's a few hours. But that's not true for a number of users in various parts of the world. Depending on uh, the users that we're talking about, they may straight up have non-existent internet. And so I want to quickly talk about how the edge can maybe help keep services performant or at least reliable for users in this situation. And the example I want to talk about for this is AWS Snowball. Now, I'm not sure if anyone's familiar with Snowmobile. It's where the, like, those big transport trucks that like, drive out, you load whatever data you need to load on that you want to back up to the cloud, and it drives back to a AZ data center and uploads it. Snowmobile is a much more pared down version of that. It looks like a computer from the 90s, and you, you order it online and it gets shipped to you. And while you could use it to migrate storage, it can also be used to make uh, edge compute available in environments that are very remote. Some of the examples that in AWS's marketing material for this is folks that work on ships, windmills, and remote factories. So very, very remote. And while I'm not necessarily expecting that a lot of you are serving users in those contacts, I did want to touch on this briefly because depending on where your careers take you, I wanted you to keep this in mind because you, in order to deliver performant, reliable services, you may need to be so on the edge that you are literally on your user's doorsteps. Now, I'm not sure if anyone knows who this is. A little bit of pop culture trivia for you all. You know? <laughs> no worries if you don't. Um, so this is Captain Planet. Um, he's an environmental cartoon from the, the late 80s, early 90s. And I thought he would make a great segue into our next section, which is now that we've talked about how we can boost the performance of our applications, I want to go back to that other part of the question I asked at the very beginning, which is how the edge can help us fight climate change. And to start with, I want to open this section up with a quote that I saw at another talk called Can Green Software Solve the Climate Crisis that was given by uh, Sarah Bergman, who's a software developer at Microsoft. And if, if you get a chance to watch her talk online, it's fantastic. I, I highly encourage you to because it was very impactful for me. But this quote in particular really stood out for me. So I'm going to put this up and give you all a few moments just to quickly read that. That's wild, right? I feel like that's not an overstatement. The fact that we as an industry, we're on track to account for more than half of the current relative contribution of the whole transportation sector by 2040 is just wild to me. And I don't know about you all, but thinking about the carbon emissions of the software that I build was not something that I necessarily thought about or was encouraged to think about several years ago. But I think that has to change because this quote was published in a journal from 2018, and so much has changed since then. Like five years is nothing by human standards, but that's eons in technology. 
And in the past year alone, we have seen an explosion in the use of AI. AI models have become much more accessible to the average developer. And it seems like every other day or every other week, there's some new company out there that's got like an AI-powered tool here, an AI doodad there. And existing players are incorporating AI however they see fit, into, see fit into their products, whether it's a good idea or not. And this has a real cost, energy-wise. Um, and because it's consuming so much energy, it has a lot of carbon emissions. And so I think, in general, we just need to think about this a little bit more and be a bit more mindful. The International Energy Agency, which is an intergovernmental body in Europe, published this great report on cloud computing's environmental costs. And they broke it down in a really helpful way for us. And I particularly like that they broke out crypto into its own section, um, because we all knew that I think crypto was a bit of an energy hog, but it really, like, really puts it out there just based on those numbers. Um, and the three areas here that I want to highlight that the edge can help us in fighting climate change is these three. Data center workloads, data center energy use, and data transmission network energy use, which is just a fancy way of saying energy used while transmitting data over the wire. Because when we run our code closer to our users, like we saw in our pet store example, we can actually reduce the load on our data centers. And depending on what types of requests are being moved there, depending on how many of them and if they're done in a strategic way, you might actually be able to not just reduce the amount of energy that's being consumed running those workloads, you might be able to reduce the size of the machines that are running at those data centers, thereby reducing their energy use further and their associated carbon emissions. If you're able to store data at the edge closer to users or take in as far as you can go with this, let's say you pursue an offline first architecture or a local first architecture, which uh, Brooklyn Zelenka is going to be talking about after lunch, you can reduce the size of the databases that you are maybe running in these data centers and reduce the energy use associated with keeping all that data. And when you're running code closer to users, when you're hosting data closer to users, and resources are making requests for them, they're not waiting uh, for, like forever for these responses. They're not consuming electricity idly waiting for a response to get back. They can just move on to their next thing much quicker, which means that that's reducing the carbon emissions related to data transmission. So again, it's these like tiny things here and there, but they all add up to a really meaningful difference in terms of not just boosting the performance of our web applications, but reducing our costs and reducing the carbon emissions associated with our software. And I think it's very rare that we have like wins all around like this, which is really exciting. Now, I have to talk about the limitations of the edge. I'd be remiss if I didn't. Um, and there's a, a few broader things to just be aware of if you're considering using the edge in your own applications. The first is there is lower CPU time available in edge uh, functionality compared to, let's say, normal serverless functions. Now, this is not the same as wall clock time. This just refers to the amount of operations that you can run uh, at the edge. Uh, and that being said, you, uh, if you make a network request, it doesn't count toward that time. However, like we've spoken about, you want to be a bit more mindful and strategic with what kind of requests you're making from the edge, because depending on where those requests are going and how many of them you're making, you might actually remove the benefits of running that functionality at the edge because of all the latency that's being incurred from making those requests. So, if you decide to take this path, just you know, be strategic, be mindful about what you're doing just so that you're still getting uh, the maximum effectiveness of running that functionality at the edge. And then they also have smaller caches. Um, you can get a little bit more wiggle room by using regional edge caches, excuse me, uh, which allows you to store uh, a little bit more data closer to your users before having to make a distant request to an AZ. Um, but again, it's just be a bit more strategic so that you get the most uh, bang for buck for running that functionality and storing that data at the edge. It's also a little bit more expensive um, than standard serverless functions. Um, so before you get too excited and put like all of your code and all of your data at the edge, I would encourage you to take a more incremental approach just so that we're not unpleasantly surprising our chief financial officers with an unexpectedly high cloud bill at the end of the month. Um, and just so you can see if this is getting the performance cost uh, that you, that you want to see by moving that functionality and storing that data at the edge. Now, we've covered a lot today. Um, we've, we've taken a look at um, taking a, you know, serving a functionality from a server-side rendered page and moving it to a static page, which helped boost the performance quite easily with like 10 lines of code. 
Um, we've also taken a look at what data at the edge can look like, um, either through something like PlanetScale or Cloudflare, where you can just make requests and cache that data at an edge function, or actually store that data at the edge closest to our users. And we briefly looked at what using the edge looks like for maybe mobile or backend services, or people who have highly intermittent or non-existent internet in their, in their locations. And while we've briefly talked about the limitations in the edge, we can feel comfortable starting to use the edge in certain use cases rather than um, defaulting to running that, data, running that functionality and storing that data in an AZ far away from our users that are making those requests. So if you're interested in using the edge today or you wanna start taking a look at the potential of it in your particular stacks, I encourage you to take a look at high traffic, very focused pieces of functionality as candidates for maybe moving that to the edge. Things like setting request and response headers, setting session cookies, A-B split testing, validating user sessions. These are all great use cases for moving that to the edge um, without a major re-architecting of your application and you can start getting some performance wins very quickly. And if you're interested in the carbon emissions side of things, I highly encourage you to take a look at the W3C's Web Sustainability Guidelines, which they published early September, um, that looks at sustainability not just through an environmental lens, but also through things like social equity and accessibility, to name a couple of others. Uh, cloud providers also have carbon calculators in their dashboards these days as well. Um, you may not have access to them, but if you do have access to them, that is something that you can look at to see which resources are consuming the most energy and emitting the most carbon. You can make decisions based on that. And then there's also the Green Software Foundation, which has free resources for developers to take a look at, such as design patterns that you can adopt, as well as open source uh, tools that you can use to measure the carbon emissions of your software. So thank you so much for your time and attention today. I really appreciate it. And I hope that after hearing this, you're ex as excited as I am about the rise of an edge first future that we're starting to see. Um, if you'd like to, if you, you maybe don't feel coming up to ask me any questions, um, all my, my email and my social media handles are on my website that's on the bottom right of that slide, ericafazani.dev. Um, and yeah, thank you so much for coming out.